Hi, I'm Spencer Christian. On this episode of Tracks Ahead, we'll see one of the oldest steam railroads in the country. We'll meet a man who has both an American flyer and an HO gauge layout, and we'll stop in at the Twin Cities Model Railroad Club in St. Paul. Now, San Francisco is surely one of the most beautiful cities in the world. It's home to the cable cars, one of the most recognizable elements of this beautiful and popular tourist destination. It's easy to see how you could leave your heart in San Francisco. There's so much to see, so much to do, and some absolutely wonderful ways to get where you're going. The beautiful cable cars seem to slide with an effortless motion up and down the steep hills. They're the only cable cars in the world still operating. And it's not just tourists who ride these things. They are indeed utilitarian. We do carry about a million people a year to their jobs. The California line is almost all commuters that go downtown to work every day. And you, you get to know your customers very well. The cable cars are just one piece of the San Francisco public transportation system, a system which is as sharp looking as it is efficient. There's also a unique collection of historic streetcars. There are electric trolley buses and diesel buses. And there's a modern subway and surface light rail system. It's called the San Francisco Municipal Railway System, or MUNI for short. It's used by nearly 700,000 passengers on an average weekday. Let's take another look at the stars. Lots of people confuse trolleys and cable cars. Both run on tracks in the street. Both have bells. Both are a big part of San Francisco's history. So here's what makes them different. Trolleys, which are also called streetcars, use a long pole called a pantograph to draw electricity from an overhead wire to the car's motors, which propels them along the tracks. Streetcars have been used in cities all over the world. Many of those have been transplanted to San Francisco and are painted up in the colors of their original hometowns. Cable cars were invented in the late 1800s, specifically to climb the hills of San Francisco. They're powered by machinery at a central plant which pulls an underground steel cable through a trench between the tracks. A vice-like grip on the car grabs the cable to pull the car up the hill. We have an inch and a quarter diameter wire rope that's uh, spliced into a continuous loop that runs through the streets of San Francisco about uh, a foot below the ground, about the street level. And this is uh, powered from a central point here at the, the location we're at now, the Washington and Mason Powerhouse. And these cables uh, are running at nine and a half miles an hour. And the cable cars with a grip device, which is a lever on the car, that you can uh, pull back on this lever and it will grab the cable in a gripping type motion. You think of a pair of pliers grabbing a wire. They squeeze down on this cable. And as they attach to the cable, the car moves forward. And that allows the operator to uh, control the forward motion and to release the cable when he needs to at, a, at an intersection or to pick up passengers. Some of the cable cars are antiques. There's constant renovation and restoration. And some of the cars are brand new. The oldest one currently in service was built in 1888 by the Mahoney Brothers, and that's car 28. We make new cars from the ground up. We start out laying a keel just like a ship with two steel I-beams and proceed out from there. It takes about 18 months to build a car. It was the trolley car in the early 1900s that helped trigger explosive urban and suburban growth in America, bringing easy mobility to America for the first time. In the U.S. alone, there were nearly 100,000 trolley cars. But the trolley declined in popularity when America fell in love with the automobile. But San Francisco remains passionate about the trolley. It's an appreciation for history and a tenacious attention to efficiency and safety that keeps this system running so well. And it's a system with dedicated drivers who are in ways like artists in motion. And when you watch how they actually operate, it requires them doing about 15 things at once. Standing up on a brake, releasing the grip, pulling the track brake, swiveling their head, communicating with the people around them, and looking for the traffic. It's a real art form. Not everyone can do it. The cable car system is America's first moving national historic landmark. 
And what better place to have such a museum in motion than in one of America's most wonderful cities? By the way, travel expert Arthur Fromer picked the San Francisco Municipal Railway's Cable Car Museum as one of the top ten free attractions in the world. Let's go off to the city of St. Paul, where we'll find a railroad club that's housed in the former shops of the Milwaukee Road. There we'll find a great O-gauge layout, one that reflects the history of the area. The night trains are running. It's a special thing to see here at the Twin City Model Railroad Museum in St. Paul, Minnesota, where trains run for the public six days a week. We're normally open during the day, and uh, these trains are really detailed inside, and they're also lit. And uh, during the day, you can't appreciate that, but we, we were uh, doing some things, and it just ended up that the lights were down, and we realized this turns into a whole different situation, you know. And, of course, at that time, there was very few lights in buildings, but uh, as the excitement built, people were busy running around here putting lights in everything that didn't move fast. The night trains only run a few months of the year, but the museum is open year-round. These O-scale trains run along eight miles of track. Two lines are for passenger lines, two for freight. Each line is two scale miles long. The museum is what used to be the St. Paul Craftsman Hobby Club. The uh, club officially formed as a craftsman club in an abandoned storefront in uh, 1934 on Grand Avenue and uh, they modeled anything, they even uh, little gas race cars and what have you. And then in 1939, uh, the interest had strongly moved to railroading and the uh, uh, Carl M. Gray from the Omaha Railroad uh, asked if we wanted to build a display railroad down at the St. Paul Union Depot, which we did. Uh, it took about a year to get open to the public and so we operated down there for 40 years and what they asked that we would have a railroad that would operate for the public and uh, I think what caught on was the fact the amount of enjoyment you get out of building something and then sharing it. There's some beautiful railroads in basements but nobody gets to see it. It's like artwork that never gets to be you know viewed or something and, and it's a shame and uh, over the years we've attracted some very good craftsmen at recreating this stuff. The recreations can be startling. Look around this layout and you start to see things that look familiar. Actually, more than just familiar, they're so real, it's almost scary. Well, the magic, let's start by that steel bridge out front where Marv Quinn, one of our retirees, spent 23 months cutting and forming over 3,100 pieces of cold rolled steel and then soldering them together to make those two beautiful spans. And they're so accurate that you have a fixed foot over here and then expansion and contraction foot over here. It's terrific. Things like that, they just thrill the daylights out of me. Volunteers like Ray Norton are the heart of this special place. At a time when some are retiring and heading to Florida for the sun, the old guys here in the north are basking in the glow of train lights. I started in 1984 here. Yeah. I needed a hobby. I don't have enough of them. So I had to join the Twin City Model Railroad Club to do a little of this cosmetic railing work. An old retired carpenter, you know. Well, he so. called it a carpenter, but I tell you, <laughs> if you look closely, He's more like a cabinet maker because the work he does, it's just beautiful. The one thing I am proud of is, is Jim Hill Stone Arch Bridge. Yes, indeed. And uh, the studying I had to do to build that was just He's fantastic. He's got over 2,500 pieces of wood in that thing. The layout depicts the Minneapolis Milling District as it looked from 1935 to 1955, a transition era a time when steam and diesel engines worked side by side. Here you'll find an ever-changing display of impressive trains, including one Hiawatha that holds a solid place in Ray Norton's heart. You see this space back here? In 1940, 
I wanted to go from Milwaukee to Chicago rather rapidly. My cousin and I, we'd been down to the NMRA, the National Model Railroad Association Convention, and we wanted to go down and see his dad at Chicago. So we were hoboing, and as they pulled out of the station, they went across the grade crossing. We ducked under the gate and got on. And I clocked miles as rapidly as 34 seconds. That meant that he was running 106 miles an hour. You see, the driving wheels on that engine were seven feet in diameter, and they didn't have to turn over too often to cover a mile. So uh, <laughs> then in order to miss any reception committee they may have had, when they got down to about 20 miles an hour, Jack and I dropped off. Oh, but it was beautiful, and it's something I haven't forgotten. Now that the layout is done, it's here for you to visit. But don't think just because it's done, you're always going to see the same old stuff. Well, the first thing is, you mentioned the word done, and in model railroading, there just ain't no such thing. That's, you understand, because they can do a beautiful job on it. They'll just get on another beautiful job and add it, or they will make a change. But uh, it's never done. As long as the love for model trains lives, you'll find guys like these keeping them going. And while they might argue over what's better, steam or diesel, you just know they're having a grand time. Every once in a while we soften up just for the general public, but other than that, why we are our old natural selves. We get in each other's hair as often as we can. The Twin Cities Model Railroad Museum brings in visitors from all over, folks for whom a day at the rails is a happy one. You can't beat it, because it's a railroad that runs well, it looks good, and it, the models are really quite accurate. So for one who loves model railroading, what more could I ask? There's something that we all admire about dreamers, people who always wonder about the possibilities. Shortly, we'll meet an Illinois man who is not only a dreamer, but a man with the determination and the wherewithal to turn those dreams into reality. First, it's off to Heber City, Utah. The first train made its way up the canyon from Provo more than 100 years ago. The Heber Valley Railroad line is not only one of the oldest steam railroads in the country, it's one of the best. Clouds of steam and steel wheels on steel rails can only mean one thing, the train's coming. In Utah's Heber Valley, the lonesome whistle is a regular thing to hear. But these days, there's nothing regular about being able to step aboard an old steam train, and that's why they come. Well, they're, they're not making any steam engines anymore. Um, uh, railroading is, is uh, mostly freight hauling, as, as, except for Amtrak, there's very few uh, really true passenger trains. But uh, Utah is a state that is, uh, is famous for the railroads, uh, the, the Golden Spike in 1869. And this, uh, this railroad is over 100 years old. And so it's a matter of not only entertaining the people, but it's preserving history. Uh, we, can, we, we preserve what, uh, what is left because we can't, it'll never be again. It's gone forever if we lose it. It would be a shame to lose this. The place wouldn't be the same without old 75 built by Baldwin in Philadelphia way back in 1907. I like to think of a locomotive much as or, or similar to a human being in that it has a style, a personality, and it changes from day to day just like we as humans change from day to day. Atmospheric conditions, uh, types of coal, type of water, 
Uh, the type of people you have running the locomotive will cause it to change and act differently than it would with different conditions. The neat thing about this locomotive is with the right conditions, the right day, good coal, good atmospheric conditions and a good crew, wonderful engine to run. You get an imbalance somewhere, anywhere, in any one of the equations, the whole day can go straight to nowhere. And uh, it's one of those things that you work with it and you try to learn what it wants, you give it what it wants. And as you give the locomotive what it wants, you'll find out that it'll give you what you want. Unlike a human, her heart is made of iron and runs on coal. She's stoked and primed by men who still call railroading their way of life. Like her, they're living reflections of a different time, a portion of history that only lives on in a few notches of America, spots like here in the Heber Valley. It's a ride to savor and remember. We'll leave Heber City and we'll go across the farmlands of the Heber Valley. Uh, there's a number of uh, alfalfa fields. You'll see some cattle out in the fields as well. Uh, we'll come around an area called Soldier Hollow. That's the, uh, the, the Olympic venue of cross-country skiing and the biathlon for 2002. Then we'll follow the lake shore of Deer Creek Lake for about five miles. And along that lake, uh, you'll find uh, desert scenery, sagebrush. And when we get to uh, Deer Creek Dam, we'll descend into the canyon on a 4% grade. And we'll go into uh, a pine and aspen uh, filled canyon. It's absolutely spectacular in the fall. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's just nice year round. And, uh, and we'll follow the river, Provo River, for about uh, five or six miles until we get to uh, Vivian Park. Vivian Park is where we stop and turn around, and that's a, that's a trout pond, uh, pavilion, uh, children's playground area. It's, it's quite nice, and uh, people spend about 30 minutes down there before we turn around and come back. These rails, coaches, and the 75 are movie stars. They've been in 31 feature films, including A River Runs Through It and the TV show Touched by an Angel. For some reason, the magic of the railroad is coming back into, into fashion. So you see them in commercials. Um, Touched by an Angel has used us a number of times. And uh, I just think it's a, it's a, a unique, uh, interesting, uh, something different for the film companies. For a time, it looked like this old line was lost. When they turned it into a tourist line, there wasn't much to it. Well, uh, we started with basically nothing. Uh, when we first started in 1992, we had a 618 and we had an MW2 uh, diesel locomotive, 1939 diesel. And what we've acquired in the, in the last eight years has been pretty phenomenal. Uh, we now have uh, five locomotives, uh, three diesels, uh, two steam engines. We have uh, the railroad cars that were in uh, uh, A River Runs Through It, uh, along with a number of other freight cars. We have our maintenance away equipment. We have one car called the Molly Brown. It's uh, a car that was, it's a wooden coach built in 1890 and purported to be uh, the private coach of the unsinkable Molly Brown at one time. So we can't prove it, but it's a great story. 75 is rolling up on the century mark. A lot of folks ask how long she'll last. John says the old 75 has a lot more good years in it. I think that steam technology is only getting better, not getting worse. And a lot of people will argue that point. Well, the old guys that did this back in the day are dying off. Well, us new kids that are coming up have some new tricks in the bag and we've learned some new things, and we have some things that we can apply to the old locomotive. And it's causing them to last longer and run better. And what better place to run than through Utah's rugged country on a line that moves you forward and takes you back at the same time. Like so many of us, Homer Henry fell in love with trains when he was just a boy back in the 1950s. He would sit on his grandmother's porch in La Follette, Tennessee, and watch the cars of the Louisville and Nashville rumble by. So it was no real surprise when Homer Henry began a career with the Santa Fe in California. He went from brakeman to engineer to manager to executive. But even as a busy executive, Homer Henry found time to pursue his love of model railroading. 
he became a master craftsman and modeler and planned for the day when he would build his dream layout. Finally, and with the help of others, that dream turned real. In his Illinois home is a magnificent American Flyer S-gauge layout created for him by a company called the Model Train Works. The Great Smoky Mountain Railway rolls through the Tennessee countryside. So I had this track plan drawn up for some time using one of the new computer track making programs that were existed in the uh, late 80s. And I drew this up at that time and uh, just waiting for the right combination of time and and uh, place. So by moving into this location in 1990, <coughs> I uh, started looking around and found a, uh, an ad in Model Railroader about this fellow from the Model, Model Train Works, I believe it was called. And he had an 800 number, and it's a very interesting little story because he had an 800 number and I called it. I had no idea where he was at in the country. So I was just talking to him over the phone, we talked about what I wanted to do. He said he normally built the layouts on location and moved it to where uh, the client was. We talked for about 20 minutes about concepts, scenery, no grades, or some little grades, etc. And finally, after 20 minutes of the conversation, I said, so where are you located at? So I can look at transportation costs, you can come see where I'm at. And he says, well, I live in Naperville, Illinois. And it turned out he was five minutes from where I lived. <laughs> so he came over, we, we hung up and he came over and we started the uh, project in about a week after that or two weeks after that. Homer and his wife also have a 10 by 40 foot HO gauge layout with incredible scenery. This too was assembled with the help of admired professionals. It's a, um, a high degree of concentration, creativity, um, artistic uh, value that uh, goes into the contribution of, of making it such a, a fun, fun experience. It's, um, it's interesting though when people come and look at both layouts that the American Flyer really tends to be more of an interest than all the extreme detail that's in the HO layout because of the noise it makes, the smoke of the engines, um, the excitement that it brings back of the Christmas mornings that we've all had during this hobby of uh, the big trains running around in a circle. And then the serious people like to look at the HO layout, but they all sort of drift back to this one and look at the flyer. It's very exciting, it's a lot of noise. Um, it's hard to even talk in here when they're all running. But the HO was uh, the, uh, the epic of uh, bringing together all the different functions of detail and craftsmanship and all that. So it's two completely separate things. Homer Henry now manages two of his own companies, one that certifies locomotive engineers, and a company called Railtech Productions, which helps produce train scenes for television commercials and the movie industry. Railtech Productions has offices in Chicago, Kansas City, and Beverly Hills, California. And that uh, company works with the movie industry, uh, not only for feature films, but also commercials, TV shows, that uh, <clears throat> require trains. Almost anything that has trains in it, our company's involved in getting the trains and the Hollywood production company together. Homer Henry is a man who's been able to take a childhood love of trains and turn it into both an exciting career and a fulfilling hobby. A fortunate man, who's never drifted far from those dreams on his grandmother's porch. Talk about talent and drive, Homer Henry is also an experienced airplane pilot. Thanks for being with us. Please join us next time for more Tracks Ahead.